The following is a paid program from UChicago Medicine. Today on At the Forefront Live, we will discuss community health priorities for the South Side and South Suburbs. We will discuss some of the challenges in these communities, the work being done in violence prevention and recovery, and some of the plans for the future. Joining us will be Brenda Battle, Vice President of the Urban Health Initiative and Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer, Katina Latham, Director of Community Benefit and Evaluation, and Dr. Dorian Miller, Director of the Center for Community Health and Vitality. That's next on At the Forefront Live. Hello and welcome to At The Forefront Live. We want to remind our viewers that we'll be taking your questions over the next half hour, so start typing. We also want to remind our viewers that today's program is not designed to take the place of a visit with your physician. First of all, welcome everybody to the program. Happy to have you here today. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to be here. Well, let's jump right into the questions because we have quite a list so far and I'm sure we'll get some more from our viewers as well. And Brenda, we're going to start with you if we can, please. And if you can tell us a little bit about the communities that UChicago Medicine serves. We're part of a neighborhood down here and, and we're very proud to be part of that neighborhood. Yes, so the, the University of Chicago um, has two communities, one in our High Park campus and one um, at our Ingalls campus. And for the purpose of community benefit for our High Park campus, um, our catchment area comprises 12 zip codes immediately surrounding the University of Chicago. There are about 650,000 people who live in these communities um, and they run pretty contiguous to um, um, our hospital. In the Ingalls service area, our community benefit service area is about 13 zip codes that comprise the Thornton Township um, community. And these communities are very diverse. Um, they're rich in culture and history. And I'd say that um, they both have uh, a lot of vulnerabilities at this time, which is the reason why we do a lot of work in community health and community benefit. Dr. Miller, I've got a question for you. What are some of the overall health challenges that you see in these community areas? I've been practicing on the south side of Chicago for a number of years and many of the challenges that we see in communities on the south side of Chicago include things like high blood pressure, diabetes, obesity. Um, asthma is particularly prevalent in south side communities, but also some of the things that are defined as more of the social determinants of health. So things like health behavior changes that people need to make in order to improve their health, sometimes are not possible because there aren't enough community resources to support them. You know, it's interesting you mentioned asthma and we're going to talk a little bit more about that here in a few minutes and in particular there are a lot of, a lot of children that are impacted pretty significantly by asthma uh, in, in our community areas and it, that's always been something that's been kind of fascinating to me is why, you know, why we see a, a greater impact here than maybe on the north side or some of the other parts of Chicago and I, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that but it's, 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 it's a real challenge here. You know, there are multiple factors that are related to why we see higher rates of asthma here on the south side of Chicago, particularly amongst children. Um, they have to do with environmental issues, pollution. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people live in housing that might be subpar and they may have issues with either mold or vermin infestation. So when you think about droppings from either cockroaches or mice or rats, all of those things can be factors in terms of um, children having problems with asthma. But something else that's involved too, and that is making sure that they receive appropriate treatment for asthma. And it's one of the reasons why here at the University of Chicago, we've started actually a pediatric asthma center. Yeah. And we actually will, will go out into the community and work with children that are, and, and of course their parents and families, but uh, that are really battling this, correct? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So what are some of the things that we do to make that happen? You know, I'm actually going to defer that question to Brenda yeah. because yeah. she's <laughs> been incredible in terms of her leadership of bringing the Southside Pediatric asthma center to us. Thank you. Thank you, Dorian. Um, so in 2017, um, we, along with the other hospitals on the south side of Chicago and the community health centers came together around this, um, this community health need and determined that we needed to stand up a asthma center that would address the issues um, of uh, asthma and uh, we would put forth efforts together collectively to address um, improving the outcomes of asthma for children. And so it's not a physical center, it's a virtual center. It is all of us working together. Um, we built um, a, an assessment together where we can determine when kids are high risk for asthma. And we have 
uh, we were fortunate to get funding to help us to staff each of the health centers and hospitals with community health workers that work along with the physicians in the clinic and they follow the families out to their homes in the community. So after seeing the child and family in the community, they will go out to that home to do an environmental assessment in the home to help the caretakers to learn how to manage the asthma within the home and to identify if there are any of those factors in the home that Dorian just mentioned, and then to help them to mitigate those issues and navigate how they could um, clean the environment more effectively. That that's been super effective. We also stood up a, a hotline, um, we call it an asthma resource line for persons who want to call in and ask questions about asthma. They can call that line, talk to an individual on the other end and find out, get their questions answered about it. And then if they need to be referred back to their primary medical home, they can get referred back to their medical home for on ongoing going care. It's tough for a kid to be a kid when they're suffering from asthma mm -hmm. because it's really mm -hmm. difficult you know, their friends are out and doing things and being active and sometimes that's a real detriment to, yeah. to that happening. Yeah. So it's, it's great that, that this is, this yeah. is going on. It's mm -hmm. good. Katina, question for you. What is the community health needs assessment? Uh, we hear a lot about it here at UChicago Medicine, but I think a lot of the folks probably in the community don't. Why is it important and what is it? Okay, well, well first we'll start with what is it? Yeah. Um, the community health needs assessment is a study, our data collection process that we conduct every three years. Um, here in, on the south side of Chicago, or say in the south land, really. And as Brenda pointed out, it covers the 12 zip code area that we've identified. And we collect data on a variety of topics, many of the topics that Doria mentioned, diabetes rates, asthma rates, um, pregnancy rates, uh, other things, what are like some of the leading causes of death for our community. And it's, it's a data collection of data from both the city, the state, the federal government, but it's also data from our communities. Mm -hmm. We did community input surveys asking the community what do they feel are their top priority health areas and what are some of the things that we should be focusing on. And we did some focus groups focusing in on asthma, as mm -hmm. Brenda said, to further inform our Southside Pediatric <coughs> Asthma Center. We also did some focus groups on diabetes and nutrition because we just didn't want, we want the numbers to also reflect what our community said as well. Um, and what we do in, with this community health needs assessment and why it's so important is we don't want to just say, well, the hospital is going to focus on X, Y, and Z. We want to use this data that can help us determine what priority health areas we should focus on and what's the greatest need for the community and how we should allocate our resources. This is our third community health needs assessment that we've conducted, and the first two informed our need to do the Southside Pediatric Asthma Center as well as other projects that we have put in place. And like I said, it, it just helps us to be to, to target our resources. And, and I imagine a lot of this also kind of helps us to be proactive, to, to do some work on the front end to prevent some of these issues. That is true, right. So, so talk to us about some of the findings of the, the most recent report, and what are some of the interesting things that you're seeing when you take a look at the numbers and the data? Okay. Well, this year we did a first look, or a deeper look, I should say, into some of the social determinants of health. We wanted to understand what some of the drivers of health could be. Income was one thing we looked at. Food insecurity, or you know, those who um, have um, a risk of not having enough food at home. We also want to know the education of our of those in our service area and the employment rate, and whether or not they had access to care, so access to a provider or access to health insurance. And some of those findings that came out helped us to d identify that we wanted to focus on chronic diseases, primarily asthma as well as diabetes because those arose as high indicators and top leading causes of death for our community, particularly with diabetes and heart disease. We also wanted to focus on um, violence in our community and what we can do to help people to recover from that. We have a violence recovery program that we put into place and we also wanted to help those to recover from any traumatic experience. So and to whatever extent we can help our community partners build services to address the mental health, to help that patient recover fully from whatever traumatic experience they had. And lastly, we want to focus on some social determinants of health. We've talked about um, access to care. We've also have issues regarding um, the food insecurity, as I noted, becoming one of the concerns. And we want to make sure that our programs, we have one program now that's in our emergency room where people come in and if they don't have a usual source of care, we have patient advocates that help to connect them to that care. 
and it, as they come in and we identify access to care needs, we want to go in deeper and further to find out, do they have other needs such as um, looking for resources for food or, or housing or what have you. So, yeah. so those are things we'll do. And I think that makes so much sense because we, it was interesting, we did a program just a week or two ago on primary care mm -hmm. physicians and, mm -hmm. and just how important they are for people's health. And I think, again, kind of to what your point is, you know, if, if we can introduce people to medical care professionals and, and have them visit them regularly and see the same person, it makes a big difference. Uh, you mm -hmm. mentioned f food insecurity, and that's one that, that kind of strikes a chord with me, too. I, I met a gentleman, we were shooting a video last year, I guess it was, last summer, on one of the programs that uh, was, was being funded in part by a grant through the University of Chicago. And, and he told me an interesting story, and he was talking about one of the community gardens that was put in place. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, he was, an, he was an older guy, and he said, you know, a lot of us don't drive because we're, we're older, mm -hmm. and getting to a grocery store is difficult. So yes. the community garden was a blessing to him because he had vegetables that were within walking mm -hmm. distance. And, mm -hmm. and I never really thought of it that way, and it, it's a significant situation. Food insecurity is a big deal. Yes. That it is. And like you said, having that resource, and we want to make sure we have it here where if you're here and they identify needs, you can obtain some food sources here. But we also want to connect people to, as you said, to places they can go that are within walking distance or near their community. Mm -hmm. To that point, we even have a garden on top of one of we our do. buildings. We do. There is a, there is a garden. Right. Yeah, that's here. Kind of yes. neat. Can we talk a little bit about violence recovery for just a moment and sure. and, and how that program uh, is, is, is working? Because I know that's, again, a very important part in, of, of what we do. And Brenda, I know you're you're plugged in there because uh, we, we have uh, uh, worked with our community on that as well. And PTSD is a big deal. I mean, that's it a real is. thing that mm -hmm. a lot of times I think we think of the people that come into our trauma center, mm -hmm. we help them, and then we let them go. Mm -hmm. and, and physically they may be okay, but there are a lot of other things right. going on. Exactly. So when we um, stood up our trauma center, we knew that we didn't just want to um, patch people up and send them home to recover from their physical wounds, but that we wanted to be able to help them to holistically recover from um, being victims of violence or being exposed to violence. So we stood up a violence recovery program. It's a hospital-based violence intervention, and there are not many in the country. There are some in the country um, where hospitals take an active role in working with victims of violence and their families to help reduce the possibility of being re-injured, to reduce um, violent recidivism, to promote holistic recovery, and to prevent, help people to prevent um, getting involved in the criminal justice system. So our violence recovery program allowed us to hire individuals to work in our emergency room, um, to work with families and victims of violence when they come into our trauma center, to help steer them toward the next step of recovering from violence. And to do this, or from um, trauma, and to do this, we work with a number of community-based organizations that are already working to provide support services, behavioral health services, housing, food, any of the other social determinant of health needs that Katina mentioned to help individuals get what they need to recover. If it's getting a job, these specialists help them to find a job. If they need support in learning how to work in a job, they help them to do that. Whatever those needs are, our violence recovery program is able to do that. And we were fortunate um, in April to get uh, funding from the um, uh, Block family and Hassenfeld family to form the BHC Collaborative um, for Family Resilience um, to allow us to work with children that have been impacted by violence and the children of adults who've been impacted by violence to help them to move toward resilience and recovery through the vi through um, after being impacted by the um, issue of trauma and violence. By doing this, we were also able to expand some existing programs that we have um, at our hospital, our Child Life Program, which helps children when they come into the hospital through the developmental uh, experience of being in the hospital to navigate the hospital experience. We're able to expand those services from our pediatric hospital to our adult hospital where we still have youth and children getting care in our adult hospital. We're also able to expand an existing program that we have here called Healing Hurt People that provides licensed clinical social workers that provide behavioral health services to persons in the community, in their home, at places where they're comfortable receiving those 
services, we were able to expand that along with our violence recovery specialists to create a comprehensive model that is now the most comprehensive hospital-based violence intervention in the country now, providing these services to help uh, victims of violence and their families recover. So we're really proud of that program and the impact that it's had on individuals. Um, we've been able to help save lives through that program, and we're super proud of um, the impact that it's had on individuals. Absolutely, and you know, it's just, it's, it's just incredible when you see the the work that's being done, and, and you know, my hats off to, to you and, and everybody that's involved in that. And I, I know you worked on this for a long period of time, and I got a, a very just a, a, a brief peek into the uh, the, uh, the the Block Hasenfeld collaboration and, yes. and that work, and it, it really kind of touched me because these are children that are impacted by trauma, mm -hmm. yes. and it, it can be various types of trauma. Yes. But yes. and it, and again, it may not even be the physical injury, but it's it's the emotional and mental uh, yes. toll that 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 happens after they witness something like that. And, yes. you know, again, I, I think most people don't even think about that aspect right. of it. You mm -hmm. don't consider mm -hmm. that. You think a hospital is a place where you come and you get some stitches and they mm -hmm. put you out the door. Mm -hmm. And it's it should be, and I think we're showing that it can be, mm -hmm. so much more than that. So again, I, I'm, I'm just so impressed that, mm -hmm. that your team is doing that and working with the other teams. The other thing I wanted to mention about that that I thought was important is the, the, the collaborative aspect of it with the, with the different community groups. Yes. Uh, we can't do this all by ourselves. We cannot. No. Mm -hmm. There's no way we could provide all of these services by ourselves. And it takes a village, the adage that it takes a village to do this kind of work, it truly does take a village. And there are a lot of community-based organizations working on violence prevention, violence recovery. And as a hospital, these are providers often that we don't work with typically. But through this program, we're able to convene those providers together with us as a hospital. The truth is, a person comes here impacted by trauma or violence, they're already high risk for um, the next thing that can happen to them. And so by connecting our work with the work of those organizations that are actively uh, working in the community, it allows us to wrap around that individual all the services that they need to recover. And so, as I said, we're very proud of the work that we're doing here and excited to be able to help the community in this way and thankful to the Block and Hassenville family for funding this to enable us to do this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Really good work. Mm -hmm. Dr. Miller, what do you think about the uh, community's reaction to the findings of the of the community health needs assessment report. What do you what do you expect and what have you seen so far? So what I've seen so far is that our community members are not surprised by the findings. In fact, they are one they have contributed to the information that has been put forth and so it's not just a question of anonymous surveys, but we actually through my community grand rounds program go out and we talk to people about what are the needs that they see around health and well-being in their communities and we collect information from that and so when they see this information posted on our website around their communities they'll say yep that's what we told you these are the kinds of things that are affecting the lives and well-beings of people in our community and we're so glad that the University of Chicago Medicine is not just paying attention to these things but also developing programming in order to address it. Mm -hmm. So so talk to me about community grand rounds because here in the hospital, when we hear grand rounds, we, we think of one thing, and probably most people in the community don't even know what that is. So if you could kind of explain to us, what, what is community grand rounds, and what do you do when you that happens? So the medical model for grand rounds is having a number of physicians to come into a room to sit down for about an hour and to listen to a lecture from some esteemed professor that's about um, an inch wide and a mile deep. <laughs> <laughs> Three questions are asked, and then everybody goes back to where they're uh, either clinical or research responsibility. But these are really community gatherings in which we have members of the community who sit on, the, sit on the same platform as members of University of Chicago Medicine, whether it be staff or faculty, to, to discuss issues of importance to the community. And it's not the typical presentation of we're going to talk about the medical management of high blood pressure or diabetes, but we have topics like live love before you give love. And that has to do with the prevention of pregnancy for teenagers. Um, topics that really engage our community members and also making sure that we respect and honor the work that's taking place
place in the community around these health related topics and so we are we use the community grand round setting in order to um, gather information from our community members about what they think are the needs and values and priorities for health and well-being in Southside communities um, this is something that was started through the urban health initiative it's been going on for nine years now we're about to launch our 10th season this fall and we are absolutely delighted well again it comes back to that whole effort of collaboration and mm -hmm. I think it's easy when you have an organization as large as you Chicago Medicine mm -hmm. that people will think that oh they're they're just pushing everybody around we don't want to do that mm -hmm. that's why we want to be collaborative with you know this is this is our community we're part of mm -hmm. the community that's right. <coughs> um, and that's that's very important mm -hmm. Katina can you tell us how the priorities were determined for uh, and, and what was the community's involvement? As well? Okay. Well, that was a long process. <laughs> <laughs> I can um, imagine. Right, it was, because it was over a hundred sort of factors to look at. We, of course, started with the Urban Health Initiative, the staff among um, that group, and just um, identifying what we felt were the needs. We also built on our past community health needs assessments. You know, every year we're taking inches and inches closer to sort of re further refining so we can make sure that we're properly addressing the needs. But I would say this year, more importantly, we used, um, of course, we always use and talk to faculty such as, and doctors such as uh, Dr. Miller, but we also used the community more so in this go round. We, they were involved in designing the, the community health needs assessment, and they were certainly involved in helping us determine what the priority health needs would be. And we did that through our community advisory council. This is a council of representatives from our community. There are people who are involved in ba community-based organizations, so partners that we work with, but also just individuals who are devoted to making sure that the Southside community is thriving. And we met with the work groups of this committee. We have an adult work group. We also have a maternal and child health work group, and we have a violence recovery work group. And it, at each group, we would go and present the information that we'd have and get their feedback and their input on not just what we, should, like I said, how we should design it, but on our findings. And they gave us directions to say what they felt was important. Like, for example, as part of our social determinants of health, they said, look, people want to know about jobs. You know, we can go and talk about health, but at the end of the day, people want to know how do we get jobs. And so that's how we added that as part of our social determinants of health. That's great. Mm -hmm. So we are getting some questions from viewers, so I want to pass a few of those on if we can. Mm -hmm. uh, one of them is, how is UChicago Medicine managing the growing emergency room demands? And I assume they're talking about trauma in our new trauma center, which has been open for about a year, a little bit over a year. Um, mm -hmm. Very important thing that we're doing, and, and I think um, obviously there's been a benefit to, to the community, but there's been a benefit to us as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I would say um, um, we are managing it through ensuring that we um, have the staff to support the needs in the emergency room. When we opened our new emergency room, um, oh, about a year and a half ago, uh, we actually grew, we, we grew it to be, um, to allow us to be able to take care of more people. We grew our, our bays in our emergency room so that we could take care of more of the community in the emergency room. Um, and staffed it as such. We are one of the busiest emergency rooms in Chicagoland. We realized that, and with the um, uh, launching of our trauma center, we're one of the busiest trauma centers in Chicagoland as well. So we are um, managing it um, to the day. We are often at capacity, but we have um, developed um, very good throughput in our emergency department. Um, to allow us to uh, bring people in, take care of them, um, and um, allow those who are taken care of and can go home to go home in a timely manner and those who need to be um, admitted to be admitted. But we are a busy trauma center and, and an, an emergency department and it is taking um, quite a bit of effort on our part to manage the need in the community and the capacity that we're seeing um, here at UChicago Medicine. Mm -hmm. Another question from a viewer. Changing uh, uh, subjects just a bit. How can the community connect with the Southside Pediatric Asthma Center? Okay, I can definitely answer that. Well, we have a website that you can go to. Okay. Um, it's it's southsidekidsasthma.org. Um, you can also reach out to us at our website with the Urban Health Initiative for more information. We'd love to connect with people in the community, going to schools, daycares, other events to educate them about asthma and also about the resources that we have available in addition to our partners with the Southside Pediatric Asthma Center. 
Um, so I would say that would be the first place to start. Another question from a viewer. <laughs> what are small steps an organization can take to improve the health of Chicago residents? And I, I'm not sure exactly what they're referring to as an organization, but maybe a community organization. Uh, how can they be involved and how they, can they make things better for, uh, for uh, people in their neighborhood? Any thoughts on that? Um, actually, I'd like to, to start with right. that, mm -hmm. Tim. Thank yeah. you. Um, one of the things that was in addition to our community health needs assessment this uh, time is the addition of community health profiles. And mm -hmm. so <laughs> we have profiles that are posted on our website that give descriptions of the kinds of things that uh, uh, involve both the health and well-being of people, including mm -hmm. their access to health care, um, age, and, and a number of other predictors that have to do with the social determinants of health. Being familiar with that data and understanding what's going on in your own community is mm -hmm. the first step. Another mm -hmm. step is to look at that information and to say, well, what kinds of resources currently exist in my community that I can connect to, that I can take advantage of in order to help to improve health? Some of those programs we actually sponsor through some of our community yes. benefit mm -hmm. right. from University of Chicago Medicine, but there are also others. And so I think about Southside Fit, for instance, That's as right. being mm -hmm. an example of one of those programs. Mm -hmm. But again, there are lots of resources that are out there. They may not necessarily fill all of the needs that we have in the community, but mm -hmm. first, information is the key. So take a look at the website, mm -hmm. look for your community and see what kinds of issues are going on that are impacting the, the health and well-being of the community. Mm -hmm. And I'd just like to add about the community profiles. This is something that the community asks us to do, mm -hmm. to better understand their surrounding areas. What are the assets in the community? What are the needs for the community? Where are the social determinants of health and what drives those um, in those communities? So to um, the point that Katina made earlier, our community advisory council members ask us to do these profiles for the communities to enable them and some of them are um, leaders of community organizations that have already used that information to uh, bring improvements to their community so I would advise to go out and look at your community find out what the needs are there and utilize that I think that'll give you some good um, insight in, in how to address some of those issues. Mm -hmm. So th there is good data in the report Dr. Miller and, and it's not just for us, it's obviously for the community members to, to use and community organizations right. to dive into and take a look at. How can people use this report, re, report as a resource? So if you're a small community-based organization that's interested in applying for a grant, let's say from the Chicago Community Trust, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you're interested in figuring out, okay, so what's the employment level? What are the, the age levels? All of this information is packaged in those mm -hmm. community profiles that can be put into a grant proposal mm -hmm. very easily mm -hmm. that can give a very accurate description of what's going on in your community, and you can use it for other purposes. Mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. is, that is perfect. Mm -hmm. And Katina, where do people find the report? Well, it's of course, it's on our website. Um, it's at uchicagomedicine.org forward slash community hyphen health. You'll find the community health needs assessment as well as the community profiles that we've been discussing. And each community is listed on the website, so you don't have to go and dig if you want Bronzeville, if you want Auburn Gresham, if you want um, Hyde Park, it's easily there for you to access. Perfect. We're out of time. Oh. <laughs> that that was fun. You all did a fantastic job. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you, you very, very much. much. Thank you. Thank you for being on the show and thank you for your fantastic questions. If you want more information or would like to schedule an appointment with one of your health care providers, because we always have to throw that out, please visit our website at uchicagomedicine.org or you can call 888-824-0200. Remember to keep an eye on our Facebook page for more events and live programs. Thanks for watching and have a great week. This was a paid program from U Chicago Medicine.